It's been 100 days since the first death due to COVID-19 was officially announced in Lee County. Join us for our first town hall and hear from local thought leaders about healthcare, education, the restaurant industry, and the human impact of the pandemic. Hello, I'm Julie Glenn, News Director at WGCU News. And I'm Mark Bickle, Audience Development Director at the News Press and the Naples Daily News. Welcome to 100 Days of Coronavirus in Southwest Florida, a virtual town hall. For the next hour, we will talk with local leaders about the numerous ways the coronavirus pandemic has impacted our entire community. Throughout the program, we welcome your questions for all the people that we interview. They will join us at 9 p.m. over on the internet for the Facebook Live portion of the town hall. You can post your questions in the comments section on the Facebook pages of either WGCU, the News Press, or Naples Daily News, and you'll get the answers live after this broadcast. We're also going to do some audience polling throughout this broadcast to learn more about how you're feeling about some of the topics. To participate with your phone, just go to menti.com, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and use the code 32311, that's 32311. On Sunday, it was 100 days since COVID-19 took the life of a 77-year-old Lee County woman. Hers was the first death outside of the West Coast of the United States, and since that day, 136 more people have died from this virus, and more than 3,000 have been infected. And that's just in Lee County. In Collier County, almost 2,700 people have been infected with coronavirus, and 60 have died. Statewide, the number of coronavirus cases are growing at an alarming rate since lockdown orders have begun to lift. Among the early restrictions, people were told to hold off on elective surgery so hospitals could be ready in case they were flooded with COVID patients. Which leads us to the first of our real-time survey questions for you. Grab your phone and use your web browser to go to menti.com and use the code 32311. Tonight's first question, have you avoided treatment or doctor visits due to the outbreak of COVID-19? We'll have you answer We'll have your answer to that question in just a little bit. But first, Julie talked with the CEOs of Lee Health and NCH, Dr. Larry Antonucci and Paul Hiltz, about how coronavirus will likely permanently change healthcare here in Southwest Florida. Dr. Antonucci from Lee Health, I want to start with you. Recently, restrictions on visiting hospitals were, were relaxed, and that was done by the state as the governor moved us into phase two of reopening. So I'm wondering, is Lee Health opening up to visitors as well? Yes, we are. We're doing that this week. We realize the importance of having family members present in the healing process. Now, initially when visitation was restricted, it was primarily in response to trying to protect our staff and also protect our personal protective equipment. Now that we've learned a little bit more about the virus and we've uh, achieved full protection for our staff, we feel it's the appropriate time to open up visitation. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the same situation at NCH, Mr. Holtz? Uh, we have this week. We are open to visitors only as it relates to uh, maternity, uh, minor children, and then uh, patients who are are dying, end of life care. But we're going to be talking this week about the potential of next week a more expanded uh, visiting policy, and and we'll let the the physicians lead that discussion and, and point us in that direction. I find it interesting that um, decisions like this are being made at a state level, whereas here we have a different situation than perhaps what's happening in Jacksonville or the Panhandle. So I'm wondering how much each of you look at what's happening just here locally when making these kinds of decisions as opposed to the statewide decision making. Yeah, I think it's clear that these decisions have to be made on a local or at least a regional level. If you look at uh, Southwest Florida compared to Southeast Florida, it's a completely different scenario. Uh, so I think that uh, you have to look at your own community. You have to look at what uh, what your patterns uh, look like. And then you have to build a program that is both safe and effective. So we're going to be checking all our visitors with temperatures. They will have to wear a mask. Uh, we're not going to allow visitation under 12 for people under 12. So uh, you've got to put the right program together. So I'm wondering where you see things going in the future when it comes to visitation, people coming and going freely in hospitals. 
Do you see that ever loosening up down the road? Or do you think that we will have learned something from this and keep, keep a hold of these types of restrictions moving forward? You know, there's an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal today, a whole section mm -hmm. talking about the hospital of the future. And in it, they make the case that both I think Larry and I have sort of been following all along, which is this idea of a hospital within a hospital, uh, ways to cohabitate infectious patients like we've done for COVID. And I don't see that changing, Larry. I don't think you do either, but I think this is gonna be the way hospitals go in the future is finding ways to protect our staff from the patients and to protect other patients from infectious patients. Yeah, I would agree. I think we're uh, we're in a, certainly in a steady state right now, but we're going to be monitoring it day by day, week by week. And if we have to scale back on the visitation policy or expand it, we'll do so based on what's happening. Uh, but in reality, until we have a, an effective vaccine and a significant portion of the uh, population is immune, uh, we're going to be living with some restrictions. This has really opened up the world of telehealth quite a bit. And that might, um, I don't know, I'm sure you've looked at it, uh, help with um, efficiencies in some cases. Without a doubt, we, we've seen telehealth uh, explode in our community where we were doing a handful of telehealth visits a day before the pandemic. Now we're doing on average of about a thousand visits a day. And I think what we're gonna see is that the patients realize that this is an effective way to manage uh, a lot of their health concerns. Certainly not everything, but many concerns can be managed with telehealth and they will uh, appreciate the efficiency and the effectiveness of it. Uh, and as a result, I think that telehealth is one of the bright spots that have come out of this is the, the way it is just um, exponentially increased the speed with which it's been adopted. Paul Hills, how do you feel about uh, telehealth at NCH um, with a, a somewhat older client base? Are they adapting um, the older you know, patients that you're dealing with and seeing? Are they able to pick these things up? It's interesting. Similar to Lee uh, Health, we did maybe 12, a dozen to 15 patients a day pre-COVID. Now we're doing in the range of 300 a day. But what we hear from the patients, it's, it's, a, it's a good adjunct to the traditional model of seeing your doctor in person. But I think that the patient's as we are coming back into life here, the patients miss that hands-on interaction, the personal interaction with the doctors. And I actually think the doctors are missing that too. So I don't think telehealth is going to go away, but I do think uh, the person to person in exam room medical care is always going to be there. I wanted to ask both of you how things have gone with your workers, with your employees in the hospitals as far as testing, making sure everybody feels safe and is secure and stays healthy. Um, I'm curious about that because I know when this all started, we thought nobody had any protective gear. Nobody had masks. Remember the hysteria just 100 days ago? We just did a survey, a, a quick uh, survey uh, two weeks ago of our uh, workforce to ask if they felt that they had been protected throughout the, the COVID pandemic. And overwhelmingly, our staff reported they did feel cared for and safe because we've had sufficient PPE. And I'm really proud of the fact that through this whole pandemic, we've only had one employee infected by a COVID patient. Thankfully, that, that employee has fully recovered. But we've really tried to make protecting our employees and physicians a priority uh, now and going into the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's clear that uh, as a nation, we just weren't ready uh, for a pandemic of this sort. It really has been unprecedented. So we were scrambling during those first few weeks in making sure that we had appropriate uh, protection. Uh, but I can tell you now that the manufacturers are, have sped up and now we, we feel very comfortable where we are. And I think our staff feels comfortable. And that was the rationale for stopping elective surgery is so that we would have enough personal protective equipment for the staff that had to work in the hospital. And as we began to get more uh, of the equipment, we were able to open up the surgeries again. And uh, I know the staff feels uh, that they are well protected when they come to work. Did you see a lot of people not doing, not just elective surgery because they were stopped, but I mean, just regular health visits? Did you see people holding back from making those kinds of visits? And did that end up impacting the hospital overall? 
Yeah, it was a remarkable decrease in our volumes. And we anticipated, of course, that our surgical volumes would go down. What we didn't anticipate is that our medical volume, amount, volumes and along with our ED volumes would go down. People were avoiding the emergency room, even with significant health issues. And uh, it was, in our mind, a serious health concern that there were people that potentially were having heart attacks and strokes who weren't getting the care they needed. And so now, again, we're starting to see those volumes come back up. But for a period of time, it, it was a concern for us. I'm wondering if just a couple of weeks after Memorial Day weekend, but the number is climbing, it seems like daily, does that concern you for our region? Well, we have anticipated that as the community opened up, uh, which was in the early part of May, uh, that we would start to see some increase in cases. And if you look at our inpatient COVID positive cases, we were averaging 70 to 80 for a number of weeks. And in the past three to four weeks now, that's hovered now between 100 and 110. Uh, so we haven't seen an exponential growth or certainly a surge, uh, but we've seen a new, what I would call a new plateau. And we just need to watch that carefully over the next few weeks to see where that takes us. That's been similar here too. And what's interesting is, is that the the positive rate for the COVID testing, community testing, the drive-through and so forth, even with reopening the economy somewhat, has remained pretty stable here in Naples at about 9%. So as the testing has gone up, we've had more positives, but the rate has stayed pretty similar around 9%. Is there a particular threshold that either of you or both of you together are looking at that might cause you to change some things such as hospital visitation or tighten things up? Is there a certain threshold at which you need to start putting things in place to be ready for a surge like that? Well, we don't have a particular threshold. Right now we're operating between 70 and 73% capacity. So we've got adequate capacity and we've got uh, plenty of ventilators and ICU capacity. So we'll be, again, monitoring that closely because it all depends on the, the current market conditions anyway as we approach the summer, because we know that in the summertime, our volumes tend to go down. So we're not anticipating uh, the need to uh, employ our surge plan, which we have if necessary, but we'll be watching it on a daily basis. And I think that's one of the benefits of Larry and I staying in close communication. So between the two large health systems, and then we're in touch with the the county health departments too, to really have a good view of what's going on in our region to find any hot spots, any trends that would be uh, troubling to us so that we would know that early on. Speaking of hot spots, one of them has been in uh, communities of color and also concerns about rural communities that are just not as close to the hospitals and the big medical centers. Has there been much in the way of outreach that um, either NCH or Lee Health has been able to do into these communities or that they plan to do in the future? Well, I can, I can comment on that. We've got a number of uh, regional outreach programs to those areas. We have a whole department that does that. Uh, in addition, we have set up a number of clinics uh, that are sliding scale payment clinics in our underserved areas. And so uh, we try to bring care to where the patients are. Uh, many of them do have transportation issues. So as we look at our underserved communities, we try to actively uh, get involved there and, and treat patients uh, near their homes before they get sick and have to come to our emergency rooms. And that would be similar here to the one community that's on our radar right now is Immokalee. And we are collaborating with a number of different agencies that supply uh, PPE and additional testing there and really watching that community in terms of the prevalence of COVID-19. Yeah, it's a tough situation in Immokalee and we've been following that story as well. They represent a large percent of the county's COVID positive cases, but a pretty small percent as far as the actual population of Collier County. I want to thank both of you for talking with me about it's kind of hard to look forward when we're still looking back and reeling from what just occurred in our world and our community. So I appreciate both of you talking with me a little bit about what you foresee in your crystal ball for the future. It's a pleasure. Thank Thanks so much. And remember, if there's a question that you think that I might have missed, you can send it in at our Facebook Live Q&A in the comments section. At the end of this hour-long broadcast, we go straight to Facebook Live where we get to ask your questions. So let's find out now how everyone answered the live poll. 
Have you avoided the doctor's office or the hospital since COVID-19? 57% responded, yes, they avoided going to the doctor. And 43% said, no, they haven't put off those doctor visits. Interesting. The coronavirus pandemic hit Florida, many would say, at the worst possible time, especially here in Southwest Florida. There we were at the height of season, the few months when most tourist-reliant businesses make the bulk of their money. By March 20th, the governor ordered all restaurants to close dining rooms, switching over to carry out and delivery only. At that point, there were about 700 cases of coronavirus in the whole state. Compare that to today, and we stand at 82,000 cases, 2,610 of which were added in the last 24 hours. Restaurants reopened to 50% capacity on May 18th. Bars, tattoo parlors, and gyms were allowed to open on June 5th. That brings us to our next poll question, Julie. We want to know how you feel about dining out in, since the restrictions were lifted. On your phone, use your web browser. You know, we usually ask Google about something. Go to menti.com and use the code 32311 and answer the question, do you feel comfortable dining out at a restaurant? Mark got to sit down for a chat with two people who work with and report on the local restaurant industry. Here's his conversation with Rafael Feliciano, the CEO of the Food Idea Group, and Annabelle Tomatich, the food and dining journalist for the News Press and Naples Daily News. So let's go back in time to March 20th. It's a day everyone in the restaurant industry in Southwest Florida won't forget, and I'm sure it's the same for you too. Action, Annabelle, when Governor Ron DeSantis gave the order for all restaurants in the state of Florida to close their dining rooms. What was going through your mind that day? I mean, I think a lot of people knew it was coming. I was actually working on a different story, like the exact moment that the um, order came through. And I remember I was talking to an unemployment attorney and my phone started buzzing from different restaurant owners of, you know, is this real? Is this real? What do you know? When does this take effect? Just these, these questions kind of came through and I was like, oh, this is the story I'm working on is no longer a valid story. Everything's changed. It's time to shift. And Raphael, how about you? What, what, what did the news mean in your, in your mind? What, what was going through your head when you heard this was going, going down? You know, the first thing that I personally thought about was how is this going to affect the economy and season? Immediately understanding how Im how important season is to our area, it was a very quick realization that you know this could be bad. I think I knew right away that it was going to have some pretty severe effects. Yeah, the numbers are staggering to say the least. I mean, at one point it was being reported more than eight million restaurant jobs have been lost, which is like two thirds of the workforce due to COVID nineteen. Um, the industry is on track to lose 50 billion or more dollars and close to 40% of restaurants across the country have closed because of COVID. Annabelle, the sad reality is some restaurants are closing for good. I mean, what does the landscape look like right now? How, what does the damage look like out there? Um, I think it's hard to say currently. Um, you know, I have heard different estimates from, you know, 20 percent of restaurants permanently, permanently closing to somewhere north of that. Um, but I, locally, like Raphael said, the fact that it hit in the middle of season is horrendous. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of restaurants lost a good three weeks to a month of their prime earnings for the year, the money that they nest and they bank on for the rest of the summer slow season and into fall until things really pick up again. I spoke with the economics professor at FGCU and he was saying that, you know, there was a time when we were encouraged to save money. <laughs> and since the last recession, we have not been encouraged to save money. People have, you know, have financed a lot of their businesses and restaurants, especially on debt. And that debt financing is gonna catch up to a lot of people, a lot of business owners um, as this, you know, continues. Keeping on the economic theme, Raphael, um, what, what, what are the capacity numbers like in season? Uh, I mean, in season, I mean, you have restaurants going into the downtown Fort Myers or any or downtown Naples, downtown areas. I mean, doing anywhere between four to six hundred covers a night to 
doing in the summer, just closing their doors completely. But then now they open their doors up and it's 50% still in the beginning of June, maybe a hundred percent in July, maybe. And then it's, it's the summer. So there's less population down here. We're going into what could be a really horrendous hurricane season. And then you get hit with September. I mean, if we're just talking about the economy here locally in Southwest Florida compared to other areas, it's almost like a perfect storm of what could be bad for the hospitality industry. Yeah. So what are, what is the new normal then? What are the, to adapt or die? I mean, what, what is happening out there right now to adapt? I think it's been every step of the way, these, these different various adaptations and evolutions, you know, that they've had to take week by week and day by day in some cases of, you know, how do you make takeout profitable? How do you make, you know, your bar program still profitable? How do you, you know, if you're a brewery, how do you get your beer to people? Um, I think there's been a lot of innovation that we saw in those weeks of just, you know, scrappy, crazy stuff that might have seemed insane a year ago happening on the fly. An example of that innovation? Uh, the cocktails to go, you know, I think we saw it from Nice Guys in Cape Coral and Tulia down in Naples and um, ga Gather and Fathoms. There's several cocktail bar programs where they were making, you know, jug sized down to individual cocktails. And then you could come and pick them up with your your order that night. And the Zoom wine tastings that I've seen from Angelina's yes. and some other different restaurants of, you know, really just trying to figure something out to keep your people busy and employed and you know, to, to get product out the door and to keep your name out there too. I think those are all wrapped up into that adaptation process. But going forward, I really think that, you know, the, the adaptation is, is building trust with customers and it's, it's having some kind of digital platform, you know, where either people can order online for takeout or curbside or, you know, they can, I, I saw El Gaucho Inca, they have uh, QR codes on their tables right now. So instead of having to hand you a paper menu or a, a sanitized menu, you can just take your phone, scan the QR code on the table, and the menu pops into your phone, which is really cool. So, you know, there's it's it's fascinating, and you know, it's just a it, it's adapt or die. That's <laughs> what it is. Um, like Annabelle saying, like you know, it's adapt or die. You have to adapt differently, and you have to adapt based on who you're, who you are, who your identity is. And so, I think first and foremost, I think marketing is going to be changing. I think the message is going to change. You might be, as a consumer, considering more of the place that you know is going to be that's talking about their safety, that's maybe making it part of their marketing campaigns and their solutions. Um, also, I think that a lot of restaurants, especially in certain sectors of the, of the restaurant industry, did not consider takeout as a revenue part of their business. And... I personally think moving forward, that's here to stay. It's kind of like when 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 9-11 happened, it didn't, it affected the country as a whole and it didn't stop us from traveling, but it changed the way that we travel. COVID-19 is not going to stop us from dining, but it's going to affect the way that we dine. So I, I definitely think from a business standpoint and a marketing standpoint, restaurants need to be looking at takeout as a revenue builder, being a little bit more creative with that. I think that that family style meal is going to come back where, you know, people are going to want to maybe opt at home or take their food to a park and you want to cater to those things. I think so maybe have more menus that are travel friendly, takeout friendly. Um, I, I think the marketing is going to be based a lot on thinking of how the consumer is shopping right now. Um, and then the other side of the spectrum, and I've heard this from a few different restaurateurs, and this isn't the time where we go and discount our food. This is the time that we go, hey, like, this is our food and we have really good product. And, you know, if you're going to support us, support us at this instead of trying to go that route where we discount things. So I think you're going to see a lot of restaurants maybe take away their happy hours, maybe take away their early dining um, adjusting their menus that way. It's just the reality of how you want to do business if you're going to adapt or die. In your travels, in your experiences, in your interviews, Annabelle, or just if you went out to eat at a local restaurant recently, uh, what gives you hope and confidence that many and most of our restaurants, the chefs, the waiters, the waitresses, the busboys, the owners, we will be okay and get through this and survive? 
Um, speaking personally, just a little bit, the, the first time I went back to a restaurant, I was kind of hesitant. Um, but, you know, I, I went back to a restaurant and sat outside and um, was anxious about kind of the whole experience. Um, but once everything started, it was wonderful. And you remember <laughs> that we love restaurants for a reason. And that reason isn't going to go away. Like cooking is great. And I love cooking, but it's exhausting after <laughs> a few weeks um <laughs> there's something about the restaurant experience that you cannot replicate at home our drinks came out and food came out and everything i was like this is what i miss um and i i had it we had a great night so i think you know it, it takes a little bit to get over that anxiety for some people now and I'm, i know not for other people at all but um there's nothing like it there's nothing like eating at a restaurant and rafael why don't you close with your thought on that um, I, I think we're going to be okay because we have to be okay. And I think with watching how restaurants have been innovative, how they've been just like figuring out ways to keep the lights on, keep the doors open. I think that same mentality is going to really be the identity of Southwest Florida's food scene. I think it's going to be the identity of hospitality as a whole, but the, 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 the restaurant scene, the hospitality industry is so vital to the blood flow of our economy that we ha we have to figure it out. It has it it we are going to make it work. I I think it's just that that good inspiring feeling of um, just knowing that we're gonna fight and and that's what chefs do best. They fight. Great great uh, way to end the conversation. Can't thank you guys enough. So let's see how the audience feels about going out to restaurants. The second question in our live polling was, do you feel safe dining out? Here is how you responded. 82% say they don't feel comfortable going out to dine at a restaurant just yet. 18% said, yes, they do. And that's about where the capacity is at anyway. So well, one of the things that went on hiatus was school, and that became the steepest learning curve for many parents. At least that's true for me. First, spring break was extended for a week, and then the order came to close all schools down for a period to be determined. That turned out to be for the rest of the school year. Kindergarten through 12th grade students quickly shifted to at-home online learning, testing parents trying to work from home or forcing parents to stay home. Governor Ron DeSantis has said he wants all schools open at 100% for the regular August back-to-school routine but this year promises to be anything but routine, not only for K through 12 schools, but universities as well. And that brings us to the next poll question. Go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code 32311 to answer this. We want to know if you think some students will fall behind by not being in the classroom due to the pandemic. Let us know what you think. Julie was able to talk with superintendents of Collier and Lee County Schools about what this fall might look like for students and teachers. She also talked with Dr. Michael Martin about reopening plans for FGCU. What are the two different school districts, Lee and Collier County, considering as they plot the next couple of months, which I can imagine is very hard because things change day to day, week to week. But what kind of things are, have you already got in place as you're addressing these questions? Dr. Atkins, I'll start with you in Lee County. Hey, well, um, we have been, uh, of course, meeting as a school district team really since the, uh, the onset in March. Uh, then most recently, we convened a, a community group, our, our uh, pre-K to 12 uh, pandemic response task force, which has had two meetings so far and, and really just looking at different reopening models. Uh, our goal is to reopen fully in August, if, it, uh, if that's all possible. We, that's what we want to do. We think that's in the best interest of our kids. Uh, but we do have uh, some hybrid models that we're considering, and uh, we've put those forward to our committee, and we're getting their response uh, now. Uh, so we go everything really from full reopening to a hybrid, which involves uh, elementary students coming back uh, pretty much 100%, but then you're looking at uh, you know, middle school and high school students coming back, like half of them coming in uh, one day and then the other half coming in the next day. And, uh, and then maybe uh, full virtual on, on Friday for everyone or different, different models using that design. 
to to ultimately, if we're if we're not able to change much, we do have the opportunity to go back to to full virtual. But again, hope for 100% in August. And I'm wondering, Dr. Kamala Patton, what is Collier County Schools doing and what kind of input have they received? We had some great input from parents. We certainly appreciate it. And to that end, we're already planning a second survey from parents about that third week in July because we just know life is changing, right? Um, in the month of May, as you know, that's a heavy testing month for the state of Florida. So we actually feel like we gain time a little bit here in May. So I think we're very flexible, ready to go. The key thing is we want to provide safety for our kids and putting in as many um, safety measures, following guidelines as best as we can. So again, when the state gives guidance, we still have to look locally. Every week we're on the phone with our public health um, office that is representative of the state of Florida. It's the Collier Division. So every week we walk where we are, would it have to be that some potential areas do come back face to face and some may have to be virtually um, learning just because of the health situation? But like Lee County, our first preference is to have our kids back face to face. But those that have learned a new way of learning and like the virtual to offer that. So we're amplifying and putting our virtual school into higher levels, higher numbers, because we know we do have kids that now that had a taste of this e-learning and they really feel they're blossoming there. So we wanna be ready for both of those versions. So I'm curious if the state hands down a, do they do a mandate saying everybody has to open? Do you ha Are you compelled to do what comes down from the State Department of Education as far as opening or closing or distance learning? Or are those decisions able to be made independently at the district level? So I know so far the governor has given us his direction, but right with that direction is then speak to your local health representative from the state. So it's not a blanket across. There may be areas that our health um, uh, agency would tell us that we need to limit activities here or limit activities there, or it could be in other parts of the state and it could be here too, that everything's fine and we can just move ahead. So our direction has been, he passes an overarching with the direction of work with your local folks to make that decision for you. And then moving down to the micro level, um, Dr. Atkins, I wanted to ask you um, also, do you see the possibility in the future if say Lee County Schools opens completely, and then there's a flare up of COVID in a given community or a neighborhood. Is there a possibility of closing a school down in just that little neighborhood or community? Or does that have to be a district wide closure? Oh, we, yeah, I think you have to prepare for both options, but uh, certainly the plans that we currently have in place, if we have a, a flare up, like let's say at a, a particular school, you have the ability to, to close that school uh, do the uh, do learning virtually for a, a period of time and also allow us to be able to go in and 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 clean and sanitize a school uh, before reopening that. So that's just something that's become a new no normal. And just to give you an example, uh, we had a situation just uh, yesterday where we had uh, somebody that tested positive at, at one of our schools. And uh, our team, I literally got a text last night, the team was in, in the building sanitizing that night. And then of course, quarantining that, the staff that was involved. So, you know, you have to be that agile, you have to be that flexible uh, and then be able to bring that school back online. Uh, Dr. Patton, down in Collier County, I'm wondering about, um, well, all over, um, questions about equity when it comes to um, technology, uh, not just the, piece of equipment, but also access to the internet. Have you seen a lot of needs regarding that? And do you anticipate future needs? So for um, Collier, you're correct about devices, whatever the device is, whether it's iPads, laptops, that equity to create for years, we've talked about the digital divide, that this kind of um, operation of education only amplifies the digital divide. So for our kids to come back and everyone has a device solves problem one that you're referring to. But the second is that internet access. So it's really becoming a national imperative that internet access should be provided 
so that all people have access. So we have very limited places here in Collier that don't even have any coverage, very limited, but that doesn't mean that doesn't happen inside the households. So for us, the added expense has been and would be for next year is providing hotspots for families. Some of our computers have air cards, but really it's that hotspot. So it could provide technology to multiple children in the home. So that's for us what then creates and lessens that digital divide because then everyone has internet access. I know this kind of sounds a little bit alarmist, but do we need to be worried about this group of kids having problems in the future as a result of just this couple month hiccup? Well, I do. I do believe that this uh, this COVID pandemic has has certainly had and it has certainly taken an emotional toll on uh, parents and students and so forth. And one of the things that 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 are part of, I think, all school district plans across our state uh, is to be able to be aware of those social emotional needs of our students as they come back in the fall. So there's like a heightened sense of awareness uh, to get students that the help they need when they come back to us face to face. So there, there's just a couple other quick comments with that. We can see that already that the parents have a heightened sense. So you're a good mom that says it just doesn't seem like the same education that we've had. So it's not been. So you are right to have that extra concern about that. We see that. How do we see that? We see it in our summer school numbers. We always have X number of kids that qualify for summer school, but they all don't show up. The same number of kids that qualify, we already have many, many more registered this summer because I think those parents know their kids didn't quite get where they needed to get and they were already struggling. So those numbers verify our thoughts. Second one that we know what Greg's saying from Lee is the same here. Parents are a little concerned, like, how do they still help their kids? What, you know, what should I be talking about at home in terms of that social emotional learning? So on June 15th, we will have had a parent workshop. We have never had over 750 parents across our district signed up for a virtual program. So that number that attended that session already tells us parents are concerned. So I think it's as Greg said, we need to reach out and meet people where they're at and continue to provide that social emotional support for both kids, but parents too. Uh, Dr. Kamala Patton, Superintendent of, Lee, of Collier County Schools, and Dr. Greg Adkins, Superintendent of Lee Schools. I want to thank both of you for your time. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Shifting now from K through 12 to college age students and the university system, and specifically FGCU. We're joined now by Dr. Michael Martin, who is the president of FGCU. I guess you've been a little busy, even though the campus has been closed, trying to chart a path forward. So where do we stand now? Well, I think we've uh, come through some difficult times. The conversion from a traditional campus to a fully online campus in about a three-day weekend was not without a certain amount of challenge and a few bumps in the road. But I think we've done a good job in that regard. Right now, we are in the process of putting together a plan that has multiple possibilities for returning in the fall. That plan was approved by our Board of Trustees last week and will be taken to the Board of Governors on June 23rd for their approval. But it it's not, a, I guess the best way to characterize it is this, it's flexible. It recognizes that uh, there's a great deal that can happen between now and then that we can't predict. So we simply have to be ready for multiple possibilities. And it also recognizes that FGCU faces some if not unique, somewhat different circumstances than our sister institutions around the system. So we're in the process of refining that. We're in the process of figuring out where to start in terms of implementation. But we are trying to send the message that assuming conditions allow us, we want to return to something that may look like a new normal, but that will include campus-based programs come the beginning of fall semester. Has there been any discussion of returning to school early? No, we've decided not to do that. Uh, one of the reasons why we want to push as much of the semester back in some respects so we stay as much as we can out of the hurricane season. If we start early, we will put the entire semester in hurricane season, and the combination of COVID-19 and a hurricane frightens us to begin with. But also, given the nature of the local economy and our role in it, it doesn't make as much sense for us to start early. Um, for example, as you know, the economy 
in this area really heats up, so to speak, uh, late in the fall when tourism and, 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 and snowbirds and others come back. And that's the best time for our students to work and make some money. So we'd rather not take them out of the peak season for part-time work. And we'd rather not expose the entire semester to the hurricane season. So we're going to go with a traditional start and a traditional finish. So what, who ultimately decides what happens at FGCU? Is that up to the state or is that a locally made decision? I think it will be, I think we will be working within some state parameters, but I think uh, the nuance and the actual tactical implementation will be local. We have a pretty, uh, a very effective group that's been meeting great with great regularity during this entire process. And uh, they will be instrumental in doing various assessments. But I suspect at the end of the day, I don't suspect, I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, it will be my call. But yeah, we'll because I imagine what's happening in Jacksonville may not reflect exactly what's happening here in Southwest Florida versus Tallahassee versus Miami. Yep. Precisely. And that's partly because we live in a different and unique circumstance. As I already suggested, a large share of our students have to work to be able to attend FGCU. Uh, well over 60 percent, according at least to the surveys we've done, suggest that students need to have jobs in the community and the community needs to have them have jobs to recover. The second thing we have to be cog cognizant of here and clearly conscious of is the neighborhood we live in. As you probably know, three of the five counties we serve are among the most elderly counties in the state. I'm not entirely sure Charlotte County isn't the most elderly county in the state. It's certainly up there. So when we come back and when we participate locally, we've also got to be very conscious of how we keep our neighbors safe and healthy. And I'm not sure that's the same challenge every other campus faces to the degree we do. So there's a whole series of those things that I think... Uh, will have a great deal of impact on what we ultimately decide to do. And I was wondering if you've heard anything yet from returning students who may not be able to return because of the financial crisis and the unemployment situation that has kind of compounded the problem that we're facing with the pandemic. Well, there's no question that there's anecdotal evidence out there. And I've heard from a few students, both by email and a few that I've run into myself, who are quite concerned about the impact that the, the shutdown and all that's gone with it has had on them and on their families. And one of the things we're trying to do is provide some additional short-term financial aid to help some of those students get jump-started back into the local scene. And uh, both donors and, uh, and by some other means, we're also hoping to be able, at least at the margin, to relieve some of that stress but it's going to be stressful yeah. because uh, the, the economy has taken a hit and these people have taken a hit with it. Yeah, some of these students' parents also uh, yeah. financially strapped, possibly laid off. It's, it's a tough time, but it's good to be looking forward and seeing you know, what some of the options are that the university can do to help out. Yep, and, and we've had a number of people step up. We're working with the local business leadership to ensure that every student who needs a job will know where jobs are available. And we're sharing that, of course, both with our students and with those who need employees. And we've had donors step up to say, let us help create a fund that will provide short term, not loans, but grants to students who have special stress in getting back relocated, settled into their academics. We're going to try to make sure that if we have a blended program that includes some online and some in class, no one will be penalized for not having sufficient technology to participate online. So we're looking at how to provide laptops and a variety of other things to those students. So everyone will have a chance to get back into it. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Martin. It's always great talking with you. Well, thank you very much. I'm good to see you in this technology, but I hope to see you in, in the more traditional technology face-to-face -face soon, Julie. Thank yeah, you that, I'm looking forward to getting back to some semblance of normal as much as anybody. Well, listen, we'll, we'll be delighted to have some people get back and bring a little life back to the campus. Thanks right. a lot. Thanks. We'll see you soon. We asked you if you thought some students would fall behind because of not being in a classroom. Here are the results from that poll. 
Whoa, 91% say yes. They believe students are going to be falling behind. 9% said they don't think students will have any problems as far as falling behind. Closing schools, restaurants, retail, and basically life in general led to permanent closings of businesses large and small, layoffs, and people facing food insecurity for the first time ever. Nationally, unemployment skyrocketed. And in the service industry heavy Southwest Florida market, thousands found themselves jobless. And in many cases, food insecure for the first time. Mark, you got to talk with local community foundation leaders who've been working to soften the economic blow this pandemic has had on our underserved and most needy residents, as well as regular working class. Before we hear from them, we wanna hear from you. Have you or someone you know experienced food insecurity due to the pandemic? By now you know the routine. Go to menti.com, use the code 32311 to put in your answer. Whether or not you know someone who has experienced food insecurity due to this pandemic. Now let's hear from community foundation leaders about the human impact of 100 days of coronavirus. Well, these are certainly unprecedented times. I think everyone would agree. Sarah, as we mark the 100th day of coronavirus in Southwest Florida, can you help the people who are comfortably able to shelter in place understand what the day-to-day -day reality for people facing economic challenges have been and still are? Yes, um, I think I've been talking about it most recently, like bubbles. And I explained to people that there are certain bubbles in our region where things are going well. Uh, people are able to get back to work. They're in jobs uh, that were not labeled necessarily essential, like those essential frontline workers uh, in grocery stores and medical care and transportation. And they're, they're feeling pretty good right now. Their jobs haven't suffered. They have good health insurance. They have access to healthy food. But then there's other bubbles that are directly tied to poverty, to certain uh, neighborhoods where people of color live, uh, and communities that have really been hard hit. Their COVID numbers are higher than the others. Uh, they're uh, the essential workers who don't have the proper uh, protections. And so their lives look dramatically different than some of our other community. How about you, Maria? Uh, what can you share in terms of perspective sitting here as we hit 100 days of this pandemic? I mean, I think I have to echo what, what Sarah shared is that there are certainly different genres of people who've had to, just like the virus moved quickly and, you know, we first, we all had to, you know, first work from home as much as we could, then then jobs started to end and um, people did end up in bubbles. I, I think of it as more as like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, as the days went on, um, we could see a larger and larger group at that the bottom of that, you know, food, water, shelter, you know, health and safety. Um, that number continues to grow today. Um, and it's just compounded by, you know, the economic impact of uncertainty with jobs. One day people might have a job, the next day they might not because of all the ups and downs with restaurants opening and closing and 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 every, all the industries trying to gauge, you know, opening slowly so that people have jobs, but it's still not enough money to put the food on the table. It's still not enough money to go back to normal. And so the group that is at that bottom of the, you know, bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs has grown exponentially and in a very quick and scary way. So in a lot of ways, some people would point to Immokalee uh, and look at that community as sort of a ground zero for this uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I know you've had experience working in that community. Can you elaborate a little bit? Like how are things in Immokalee right now? Um, I, I think, so one of the things that affects Immokalee is, you know, the number of people that live in close quarters. Um, and then it's compounded by, um, you know, a, there is a transient population that comes and goes, um, but it's it's a community that, that does everything in a group. You have very close and tight-knit families that are beyond just parents and children. It's parents, children's uncles, grandparents, and they all live in close quarters and they're all used to interacting. Um, you know, on a daily basis throughout the day. So, and those are the people that uh, parents would go to to help watch their children so that they continue can continue working. So you, ha I think what you've had a series of 
um, sort of smaller circles that have had a negative impact on themselves, even though that wasn't the intention. Um, there's also just the lack of information and knowledge and um, you know things that you can do to protect yourself. Uh, the typical not having enough uh, protective wear um, for that community because it's so isolated early on was an issue. Um, we had some challenges trying to find you know formula and you know diapers and so the the organizations in that community came together very quickly to solve a lot of the gaps and the issues but i think because it's a culture that is already spending lots of time together compounded by the isolation and compounded by the need to work um i think it was sort of the perfect storm to to really impact that community in a much uh harsher way so sarah we said at the top this is like a milestone um 100 days looking over that course of time and bringing us to today which is June 17th for our town hall. How would you rate the community response? So we have had a strong community response, but we have to keep in mind that in other disasters that we've had in Southwest Florida, whether it's been a hurricane, red tide, flooding, uh, fires, they're, they're contained to one part of the country. But in this case, this is a global pandemic and it's affected everyone. So a lot of times when there's other disasters, a majority of the philanthropic dollars are coming from outside of the area. Uh, Hurricane Irma, for example, two thirds of our relief fund for the region came from outside of Southwest Florida. So we hmm. knew going in that the response would be different, but people want to do something. When they see their fellow neighbors hurting, they wanna take action. So people are giving as they can, but we're stressing to people, we know that right now your resources not, might not be in place to give. But if you're looking for a place to give, here's how you do it. And then most recently in Lee County specifically, federal dollars have started to pour in for Lee Cares. And so there's been more support coming in for food, rental assistance, business assistance, individual assistance, which is helping to shore things up. So right now there's gotta be a combination of relief and we all have to understand that we have to help each other. Nobody from the outside can, can help us right now. Volunteers obviously are the backbone of a lot of what gets done to help the underserved and the people in need. Um, Maria, what's going on in the volunteer world right now? How has that changed because of coronavirus? So I want to um, talk a little bit about the volunteer world in two in two ways. One, the volunteers that maybe come to mind of um, individuals that are helping the Harry Chapin Food Bank distribute food or helping the schools, um, you know, get things to children. And um, you know the organizations that are used to using volunteers have had to have done a really great job in shifting and pivoting and making uh, their volunteers safe and finding effective and new innovative ways to include their volunteers. Um, the numbers definitely shifted. Uh, but the other type of volunteer I want to um, you know bring a, some light to is the volunteers, the volunteer leaders of all of our nonprofit organizations. Um, they're volunteers too. They they don't get paid to be on boards. They don't get paid to be fundraising chairs, but they do it because they believe in our community. And so I think we'll see, um, you know, maybe some things come together. Maybe um, organizations will do things together, but um, it, it will affect and it has affected our community across the board. So from direct services to the support systems that exist around nonprofits. Sarah, how about from the uh, organizational perspective, the Southwest Florida Community Foundation, how has your sort of daily life and, and work and, and your team, how, how is, what kind of changes have you guys gone through and what are you doing differently now to adapt? Well, forever we have said everything and everyone is always in transition. And when we put our heads down on our pillows at night, we know when we wake up in the morning and we need to be prepared that the community has changed. Sometimes those are subtle changes that you don't see. Something happened in a neighborhood or an individual family is suffering. And sometimes those transitions are big, major events, a hurricane, and now a pandemic. 
So our commitment is to shift and to be working through those transitions to continue to support and serve the community. Um, we're stopped talking about when things get back to normal and rather talking about what can be better as a result of this. So we have continued to work, but we're working in new and different ways. And we're not waiting for things to get back. We're not using that language. We're adopting and adapting to this new world and taking from it what we'll continue to do once we've passed through this period. So we have continued to be committed to fundraising uh, for the region, for the relief fund, supporting nonprofits with things, including funding, but in addition to funding, being their advocate, making sure they're included as businesses when it's time to support businesses through small loans and stimulus money, and then just keeping an eye on our own operations. We have to keep our operations shored up so that we can be the best for the region we serve. You both get to look into the camera right now, and I'll start with Maria. What is the one thing that the viewers watching tonight can do to help those who are most in need in our community? The one thing, I I don't know if it's possible to say the one thing. Um, I, uh, compassion, uh, assistance with find your favorite cause, find what you really, really care about. Each of those groups has a need for you, um, whether it's funding support, whether it's uh, support with volunteer activities, whether it's an educational opportunity. Um, you know, we will we will all get the most out of working together. And, and I think the continued partnerships, we've been able to really create a great partnership between the major funders in our area, United Way Community Foundation and the Schultz Foundation and us. Um, and together, we've been able to look at making sure we're not duplicating services, but we are also identifying hotspots. Um, so I think, you know, the general public, everyone be patient with each other. Every, not everybody's at 100%. And um, that's evident everywhere you go, stores, driving, everywhere you go. But I also think if people want to give and want to help in some way, find what really warms your heart and then connect with that charity call Sarah and Lee County, call me here in, in Collier County, and we will find um, an organization that really, really needs your help. Sarah, you get the last word. I say, get engaged and stay engaged. Everybody's life circumstances are different right now, but civic engagement is important. You can vote, you can fill out the census. That census will impact new uh, money that comes later in other times of need. And that engagement is critically important right now. At whatever level you can, get engaged and stay engaged in what's happening. Thank you for participating in our town hall. We really appreciate it. So food insecurity and do you know somebody? Let's look at the poll question. Have you or someone you know experienced food insecurity due to the pandemic? 24% say yes and 76% say no. Well, that yeah, turned that out better yeah. than I thought. Um, that's good, that's I good news. There would have been more. That brings us to the end of our one hour broadcast here on WGCU. Now we're going on to Facebook Live with a virtual town hall where we're asking your questions of the people you just saw speaking to. We'll see you on the Facebook pages of either WGCU Public Media, Naples Daily News, or the News Press. And if you'd like to submit a question, please do so in the comments under the Facebook Live. We'll try our best to get to all of them. Thanks for being part of our conversation tonight.